I work at CBC doing reporting on multi-platforms. And I was asked by the wonderful people who organized this panel to moderate this one. And I follow all these fine folks, so I jumped in and said, yeah. Uh, to introduce our panel today, Dr. Janai Aragon. Did I say that properly? You did, thank you. Okay, is a political scientist at the Department of Political Science, the University of Victoria, previously teaching political science or women's studies at three universities or colleges in Southern California. She comments on issues related to social media and politics, feminism and gender and American politics and currently is working on a project focused on pedagogy, popular culture and technology entitled Feminist Pedagog... Pedago you say it. Pedagogical. Thank you. Border crossing using popular culture to teach globalization to the net gen. She and two colleagues from Women's Studies are also editing an introductory Women's Studies book that will have 50% Canadian content. Matt Wright found his passion by chance in the early 1990s in Europe with a simple question. Can five hostels work together on common internet marketing? That led to a Belgian-based, worldwide budget travel marketing company consulting with airlines, tour agencies, and governments. In 2005, Matt returned to Victoria with his family and founded The Right Result, focusing on small business, NGOs, and community organizations offering integrated web, graphic, and social media marketing. Matt's active in political and community activism, creating best practices for social media in issue and political campaigns. He is the communications advisor for the former MP Keith Martin, campaign manager in a city of Victoria by-election and communication director for Christopher Coston in the recent federal election. Busy. <laughs> and Mike, and I have to look away from the word to say it, Gregan. Gagan. Gagan. <laughs> Uh, is one of the foremost, it's toward the end of the day for me, my mouth stops working, one of the foremost government and media relations consultants working in British Columbia today. At the provincial government level, he served five years as a ministerial assistant in the portfolio, those are the people with real power, I understand, <laughs> in the portfolios of agriculture, fisheries, and food, and small business, tourism, and culture, and from his vantage point, Mike gained an in-depth knowledge of the many challenges many challenges facing the private sector in BC. Welcome panel, thank you for coming. So the first question is, we just had a federal election recently, does anybody remember that? It seems so far away. Um, and Twitter, everybody was, was touting this as the, the big social media election, bigger than, than any other election when it came to social media. So I'm gonna ask this in a debate format, you remember debate club from high school, be it resolved, if Twitter decided elections, would we have a different result? Who wants to jump in? You have to hand each other the mic, by the way. Let's start with the academic. Um, do we have to? Twitter um, decided the election. I think what we see is that more middle class, tech savvy, white collared, white people would decide the election. But isn't that what happened anyway? <laughs> well, I don't know. Not the middle like that. <laughs> well, actually, my perspective would be if Twitter had decided the election, Jack Layton would be Prime Minister of Canada right now. I think uh, there was a heavy skewing towards the political left in terms of Canada's uh, political spectrum. Um, and that was in part because uh, the federal conservatives ran a uh, very uh, disciplined, if you want to use that term, others would say constrained uh, campaign where they stuck uh, <clears throat> very much to their specific message, didn't, weren't really interested in engaging in a debate online or elsewhere. Um, and the effect was is that, you know, they did what they needed to do as, as the liberal vote collapsed, they got what they needed in terms of a majority. Um, one of the consequences though is when uh, the NDP started to surge in Quebec, uh, Twitter and, uh, and other social media really, I think, helped uh, uh, sustain that momentum, and that's why we see the NDP as the official opposition in Ottawa. Uh, Sentiment-wise, I would agree with Mike here. Um, I'm a stats person. I have to be for my clients, especially. I've got to provide them with metrics. And there's a great service out there. It's a wonderful lady by the name of Marilyn, I believe, who put together this website called PolyTwit. And there's some wonderful stats and graphs and numbers on there about social media use during the election campaign. And got some graphs in front of me. And yes, 
In terms of positive partisan tweets, both in numbers and in potential influence, the NDP won it by far. So if Twitter had been the medium in which we elected a government, Jack Layton would be the Prime Minister now. What is interesting about what Mike said, that the Conservatives, yes, they ran a very controlled and tight campaign, they actually tied for second in positive partisan tweets. So they would have been the official opposition. Take it to another side. If, you, if the question had been, if Facebook had decided, it would have been the NDP first, the Liberals second by far. So it depends on the platform and the medium. So my follow question is then, um, what is the worth of these tools if they do not seem to show an accurate reflection of what really happened? I think one of the things that we need to understand is that there's only a small segment of the population that's actually using these tools. I mean, we think that there's a big number of Canadians who are on Facebook, right? But a much smaller number who are on other social networking sites or on um, Twitter, and you're getting a certain type of user, early adopters. I mean, it, I think it's even fair to say that um, compared to so many other Canadians, the small percentage that are on Twitter right now are early adopters. I mean, maybe they weren't on four years ago, um, but that you know that's another decision or a discussion. One of the things that we also need to realize is that it's another way for the politicians to get out their message, get out the vote and that we can't expect it to completely change, you know, cause a revolution. Uh, I think what we saw in 2008 with the American presidential election was a major change, and it was a game changer. And now we see that everyone is on Facebook, the politicians, and have fan pages, um, what have you. And now we're seeing that in Canada as well. So this was a big social media election, but was it a Twitter election? No. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would agree. This that um, it was not the Twitter election. Um, we haven't had that yet. But was Twitter influential? Uh, to, to absolutely, there was influence there, as was the case with with Facebook. And I suspect um, in the next federal election, you know, we'll see various uh, smartphone uh, uh, applications playing certain roles. Whether it's like you know, find out where the various politicians are or what have you. Um, where I think there's been some interesting impacts um, in terms of, uh, you know, Canada, uh, Australia, and the United States, there seems to be uh, much, well, uh, certainly I've noticed it locally, um, is that there seems to be much more interaction going on now between reporters, politicians, and like I say, those those that are engaged in in the social media, in Twitter. So it's, bro it's broken down some of those barriers. I mean, there was barriers that existed between, uh, between reporters even. Uh, you know, they, they were from competing outlets, they didn't talk to each other. It was all about getting the scoop. Now, now information is being shared uh, either deliberately or inadvertently through Twitter as people broadcast stuff out. Politicians are, are obviously, they want to highlight certain things. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's, there's people who are then responding directly to the politician or whoever the politician has working for them doing their Twitter account. Um, and, and also people are engaging with the reporters and, and giving feedback. So that's, a, that's an interesting development. Does anybody follow Katie O'Malley on Twitter? She's awesome. <laughs> you said it, exactly. If you're not, please do. She's actually fantastic. She's the parliamentary she, she reporter did, for... Yeah, she yeah. can make committee meetings. Cool. That's yeah. right. Yes, she actually makes uh, part she's of the quite special. She's a, yeah. she she works for uh, the show Connect and for Evan Solomon, and she's the online she's the mobile journalist for that program. Right. So that that ties into um, uh, what Michael was saying that um, politicians and media are connecting in different ways. I think that that's an important thing to recognize is that it's not just about the press release anymore. That you know you get that in the office. Right, and then you phone up the politician when you got some time and say, can we do a story about that? And that may come out that afternoon, the next day or the day later. Now it's more of a, it's a tweet out. The reporters grab it or one of you grabs that and ask a question straight back to the politician or that politician's team. So the level of communication between the voter, the media, and the political party or the candidate, that relationship has changed dramatically. Having said that, not everybody is Tony Clement. Is anybody following Tony Clement on, right? 
Okay? Yeah, he's a gentleman. All my <laughs> That's right, exactly. Right? Okay? <laughs> no, I, I, I can stop anytime. Yeah. <laughs> but again, uh, he knows how to use social media to his best advantage. And it's not all about policy and I'm here and I'm doing that. You know, there's a lot of personal stuff and he's, a, he's using humor and he's making a, uh, he's connecting with people uh, on a different level. Having said that, there are very few politicians out there who can do that at any level of government. Um, if I can pick somebody on that same kind of level, uh, Mayor Sam Adams from Portland, Oregon. I mean, he is doing a brilliant job. Mayor Nenshi from Calgary, you know, he's, he's floating around like that. So that is starting to change a little level. bit. When you've got a situation in social media where people are following people of like mind, right? We set ourselves up to follow people that we find interesting. Uh, and we're sharing information within that sphere, and you have a situation where politicians, let's face it, are jumping over media to connect with certain people that they want to connect with directly uh, because they want more control over that message. Is that um, a, a place then for somebody to really learn more uh, or learn new information, something that would change their mind on a policy or, or vote for a different person? Or is it a realm of just reinforcing our, our current Ask list? that because I opened up my Jack Layton NDP app on my iPhone. <laughs> Um, and Do you have that too? I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and, and when I down <laughs> when I um, downloaded it um, at that point in time during the election, um, he was the only leader in the race who actually had an app for the iPhone, and it's been updated a few times. I mean, right now it says the official opposition. You know, and there's photos, meet the shadow cabinet, um, and the like. It's not updated as much as it should be, in my opinion. Um, I think one of the things that you can do is you can use social media as a smorgasbord to get in not being a Canadian, um, I'm an American. I follow it for the information, be able to have learned conversations about it, um, but when I'm following American elections every two years, um, I, I'm looking at a little bit of everything. There's no doubt about it as well. But, you know, the people on this panel were outliers. You know, we're not your average person. So no, that, that was the outliers. Mm -hmm. Outlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but up. <outside. laughs> yeah, that was a real knee slapper. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, actually, that's an excellent question because the the danger that we have is, you know, whether it's. Uh, if I can use an American example, birthers who can't handle the fact that you have a non-Caucasian uh, as president and he has, has a weird non-Anglo-Saxon last name. Uh, you know, whether it's that group or, you know, other groups that, I mean, you can, you, you, and this goes back to like blogging or whatever, you can get into this echo chamber effect and you see that in the political right, you see that on the political left, right? Uh, correct. And, uh, and so that is the real danger. And, and one of the ways that I've gotten around it when I when I first went on to Twitter, uh, and there's different applications that do this, but the one I happened to set up with was TweetDeck. So what I what I did was I had different uh, columns with different hashtags like BC Poly and Canadian Poly and things like that, so that that way, you know, whoever is making a comment and adding the hashtag BC Poly, uh, you know, whether they're from the light, uh, the right, or the left, or the middle, I, I, I get to see it. And the same with Canadian Poly. So it's not just a question of who I'm following and who I'm not following. It's who's who's posting under different different columns. And I find that's a way to break out of the hope is is that. Uh, this social media as it evolves will will cause um, more in the way of actual exchange of information uh, rather than just the proliferation of various bizarre conspiracy theories. <laughs> There's an old rule in campaigning is that uh, you can advertise all you want, you can spend a ton of money on TV and radio and newspaper ads and talk to reporters all you'd like, but it's the handshake that counts. It's the door knocking, it's the groundwork, it's getting out there. But fundamentally what that is, is actually having a conversation with somebody. Because you're not gonna know their sentiment, you're not gonna convince them, you're not going to be able to find out what their interest is, what, uh, what their concerns are, unless you have a conversation. And this is the power of social media, of course, is that it is a platform where you can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And you can do it broadcast-wise as well. Twitter's great for that, obviously, right? 
So I do see um, a lot of positive in that in both regards as to your question. Yes, it can reinforce an ideal. You can say, I'm NDP, I voted NDP, I like my candidate. Um, what's going on in my NDP party? What's going on with my candidate? I'm connecting with that person on Twitter. Wow, now I feel even better about that. And that's where social media can help. So it is a balance, but I think there is a positive effect with social media platforms to create that conversation. Before we go on to the next topic, I want to ask who here has felt they've had a meaningful conversation with a politician through social media? One, two, three, four, five. You know? <laughs> um, and for those that haven't, is that because you haven't tried or because you didn't feel the conversation was meaningful? Never tried. Never tried.